I mean, I don't even know if anybody noticed. I just never came back. I didn't finish the workday. I just left. If we're lucky, we'll do 400-ish deals this year, and 60 of those we'll do construction on. Like, I think the precedent's already been set that there's there's a, a reasonable expectation for what a real estate commission is worth, and they just they literally just handed down like a half a billion dollar lawsuit. A good month, we would do 700000 in net, about $230,000 Welcome back to the Investor Unite podcast, where we talk all things real estate, business, and entrepreneurship. If you are looking to ignite your real estate investing, then join us at Investors Unite. And on today's podcast, we have a huge guest that I am beyond excited to interview personally. Um, love to pick your brain, and you've been in the game for a long time. So let me introduce you to Mr. Eric Brewer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. So... I know we were talking before that you do a lot of things in regards to real estate, innovations, fix and flips, wholesales, literally everything. Mm -hmm. And you have so many podcasts out there. So a lot of people can look you up and see like how to do innovation and, you know, the whole aspect of step one to, you know, step whatever. But we want to really dive deep into business, but dive deep into family, life, like what people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, in regards to everything, so. Yeah, maybe a little behind the scenes of his life. Yeah. So I've been doing some research on you today. Uh, just <laughs> trying to get myself prepared for the podcast. Yeah. And you started off pretty much in car sales. I did. So you want to give us just a brief overview of kind of. Uh, yeah, so I um, I was not a very good student in uh, high school. Uh, my kids never really focus in, in class and other than uh, playing sports and having time to spend with my friends, I didn't really see much benefit to being in class. So I missed a bunch of school. I just, I just wasn't a good student. So I barely limped out of high school and uh, was very fortunate to graduate with my class. But I, I did everything I could to possibly fail. And yeah. somehow I just made it out alive. Yeah, I think they were happy to see me go. And um, I was really just lost um, out of school like uh all of my friends either went off to start their career with a, you know, a trade or a skill that they had, or most of them went off to college. Yeah. So after partying, like my, uh, my senior week lasted like four months. <laughs> so I just partied, went back and forth to, to the beach. And then eventually like everybody moved away or they were like, dude, I have to work tomorrow. Like you yeah. got to go. Yeah. And, uh, so I was just sort of soul searching and I just called my dad one day and, uh, he's like, um, you got to think about going to the military. And I remember what this is. I skipped a part that's pretty interesting. I took a construction job because it paid like nine bucks an hour in 1993, which was like a pretty decent amount of money for someone without a, you know, a, a real skill. And uh, I was working on this large um, uh, apartment building in New York City. It's called the Dutch Kitchen. It's right on the corner of uh, Market and Penn Street. Okay. And... Um, it was this huge renovation project and uh, I was on the demo crew and it was like, I don't know, we'll say it was like August. And I remember standing on top of a bucket and I'm like hammering the ceiling out in this demo and stuff's just falling over my face. There's like syringes and pipes and just, and I was just exhausted and hot and miserable. And they like blow the whistle for lunch, right? It's like lunch break. Oh. Lunch, lunch break. I like grab my little lunch mate, you know, red and white lunch pail and I head downstairs and uh, everybody would line up against this wall because the roof from the building provides shade. And like all these 40, 50 construction dudes would sit out there and eat their lunch and talk and rest. And um, towards the end of lunch, I still remember this dude's name, Barry Gerling. And he was like the foreman. He would come along. And go, all right, guys, time to get back to work. And he'd like, you know, yeah. rustle you up. And everybody would, like, line up, and you would see them, like, filing back into the building, right? And it's like, one, two, three, four, five, six, just people filing back in. And let's just say I'm, like, in the middle of the line, and I'm literally just like, this sucks. I hate this. I'm hot. I got garbage all over my face. There's three and a half hours of work left. And everybody else was, like, in single file going to the building, and I just kept walking. And went right to my car, <laughs> got in my car, and I was done with that job. Oh, no, he was just, I, I mean, I don't even know if anybody noticed. I just never came back. I didn't finish the work day. I just left. And then I'm talking to my dad, and I'm explaining it to him. And he's like, you got to go into the military. So I did. And I joined the U.S. Army. 
And yeah, I left in, uh, I think what, what January 16th was uh, the date I left for the U.S. Army, went to boot camp. Uh, went to Fort Knox for basic, did my AIT in Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia, and then my permanent duty station was in Fort Hood, Texas. And I did um, avionics communications repair, which is like a fancy way of saying I fix radios and helicopters. And so I did that, served my time in the Army, came home, and there's nowhere to fix helicopters in York, PA. So when I came back, I was like, what am I going to do? And um, I remember reading the newspaper, and there was a job ad in there that said lot porter, and it was like nine or ten bucks an hour. And I read a little bit about it, and it was at Deal Motor Company, which was, at the time, it was a Mercedes and a Toyota dealership. So I'm like, I like cars. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I called. um, I got an interview, and I showed up. And after being in the military, the only clothes I really had was, like, military uniforms and, like, jean shorts and, like, just inappropriate clothing to wear to an interview, right? right? But I had my double-breasted pinstripe suit for my senior prom. So that's what I wore to a $9 an hour interview. And if you've ever been to like a used car dealership, like the the waiting room for the service department is like a crock pot of stress. There's just people sitting in there. They want their car back. They're missing work. They're they're worried that somebody's going to come out and tell them it's 1200 bucks to fix their car. And I'm sitting in this busy waiting room and the service manager comes out and... Uh, He's like looking around. You can tell he's just all frazzled and busy. And he like double takes at me. I guess he noticed I was wearing like a, a suit. yeah. And he was like, Eric. And I stood up in my military training. He's, yes, sir. And he looks at me and goes, wow, uh, you're hired. And that was it. No interview, no nothing. I went back, signed paperwork, started like a couple days later. And how old were you at the time? Uh, 21. Okay. So I, because uh, I joined the army when I was 17. Um, I, I didn't turn 18 until after I graduated. And um, did my time, came home, and, you know, I was still a young little kid. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't really have a skill set. I knew for sure I didn't want to stay in the Army. It was just too rigid and just it wasn't for me. But it taught me a lot. And, uh, yeah, yeah, so I start there, and really all I did was deliver Mercedes and Toyotas to people that had their car in for service. It was, like, the best job ever. And I worked hard. I was always there early. I stayed late. I said, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, to everybody I talked to. And eventually I caught the attention of um, management and they promoted me. Um, then I ended up as a, a service manager where if we like bring your car in for service, they'll advise you on maybe repairs or maintenance that you need done. Yeah. At the time, I didn't realize it, but that was probably my first sales job. Because okay, yeah. um, a mechanic would come to me and goes, hey, this guy needs a 60,000 mile service. He needs two tires. His wipers are torn up and he's overdue for a timing belt change. And I'd be like, I don't know what any of that means. Yeah. Can you explain it to me? And he's like, well, it takes this many hours. And I would just go, well, our labor rate's 60 bucks an hour. And I would just call people and enthusiastically suggest that they get it done. So after like four months, I ended up being like the top service advisor in the region. And I was making like 60 grand a year, which at that time with no real background. Yeah, I was loaded, I thought. And uh, so eventually I caught the attention of the sales manager. The sales manager started recruiting me to sales, and I was like, no way. Like, I can't be in sales. Uh, you know, you guys are pushy. You're slime balls. You're just work crazy hours. And um, I remember I went to lunch with a guy named Brian Busilla, and uh, we we're having pizza. And he, like, said something about how much money he made the month before. And I was like, what? And I said, you, you mean, like, you made the company $25,000? He's like, no, no, no. I... I I made $25,000 last month. Yeah. And I, Brian's a nice guy, but he was like a dummy. Like he, he, he couldn't sell. He was you kind of a goofball. Out. Yeah. And I was like, so I remember right after that, uh, after the sales manager recruited me for like three or four months, me just saying, no, no, no. I just, I like, I don't even, I don't think we texted back then. I probably just called him and was like, all right, I'm in. Yeah. And, uh, I started selling cars June 17th, uh, of that year and, uh, got into, um, sales and then sales management. And then before I left the dealership, I was the general sales manager. Wow. So yeah, kind of. How long were you at the dealership in total? Eight years. Eight years. So why did you leave? Like, why didn't you just stay there? Yeah. Um, so right around, uh, I don't know. So it might've been the year before I left or the year that I finally left. Um, I was about to have my first child. Okay. And back then I worked, man, 
six days a week. And most of my days started at eight and ended at 10 o'clock at night. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm working 75 hours a week, six days a week. And uh, I knew that it was going to be a struggle for me to be a good car guy and a good dad. And I felt like I had to choose. And I just, I wasn't willing to compromise on being a good dad. So after eight years, and at that point I was making a lot of money and uh, I just walked away from my career. And um, I was lucky enough that I'd saved some money. I'd already bought a house. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't under the pressure where I had to figure out what I was going to do right away. But uh, another pivotal moment in my life where I reached out to my dad for advice. And um, he's like, hey, I don't think you're just good at selling cars. I think you would be a good salesman, you know, and you can sell other things. Why don't you figure out something that you can sell that you have a much more flexible schedule? And Mm -hmm. um, so I just started going through that process. And uh, I remember selling cars to real estate agents and appraisers. And uh, again, I remember looking at their their credit applications and real estate agents making $300,000 a year. And I'm like, that'd be cool. I think I could outsell Terry. And if he's making <laughs> 300 grand. Um, so I, I just started interviewing in brokerages, looked into getting my license. And at that time, I thought the best place to start was in lending. So I got a job um, at a mortgage company, basically cold calling refi leads in 2005. And it was an instant hit. I I made like 10 grand my first week. No, No, that's crazy. And I was like never working. I got to remember back in 2005, like there was a lot going on that we didn't really understand the uh, ramifications until later on. But it was like the easiest job in the world. I'd be like, hey, your interest rate's eight. We can get you 4% and you can probably cash out 30 grand. Do you want to do it? Uh, nobody. <laughs> it was like the best thing ever. Yeah. And um, I did that for a little bit less than a year. And my mentor from the car business, Craig Rich, who was the manager who recruited me from service, mm-hmm. uh, literally taught me everything I know about sales, had sold the car dealership and tried to retire. Yeah. But he was like 38 years old, Thank sold you. the dealership for a bazillion dollars. Wow. And wasn't ready to retire. Um, discovered an Investors United in Baltimore County. Yeah. Went to an open house. And he was like, oh, man, we can do this. Like, we sold cars. And he called me and he was like, I know you're out of the car business. Um, I'd like to talk to you about getting into real estate. So I had lunch with him like a couple of days later. And that was it. 2000, February 2006, we started uh, CR Property Group. Wow. Um, that was my first day in real estate. That's amazing. Yeah. So Investors United, it's a brick and mortar, brick and mortar you know, yeah. real estate school. Yeah. So. Very more so like a wholesale school. Like they don't teach a whole lot about conventional real estate. Like back then they would teach you how to go to the courthouse and pull lists. You think about what we can do now where I can literally go back here and click. Oh yeah. I get 3000 records for like 40 bucks, but she used to have to go to the courthouse and know like where to go, how to pull the list, manually write out postcards. Um, This was a 12 month school, but you only attended for how long? uh, Like three months. (laughs) I remember we were sitting uh, in class, Craig and I, it was, uh, it might have been two nights a week. And they were like, okay, for the next two weeks, we're going to cover negotiating. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, him and I sold 300 cars every month. Yeah, yeah, so we like yeah, looked at each other and we're like, we're bouncing. <laughs> and uh, we left and came back and started running like uh, TV ads, started putting up billboards. Already from the jump. Oh, yeah. Ads? Yeah. Wow. So. Did you do that before you ever bought your first house? I think so. Um, that's man, it's been a while now. It's hard to remember, but I, I, our first house we bought, um, from an auction and it was six time frame. Yeah. And messed up pretty big time. We bought a, what we thought was just a regular residential brick rancher, but it was in a area where it was zoned commercial highway. So we were like, okay, we're going to renovate it and then we'll sell it. And somebody pointed out to us that like, Hey, you can't sell a uh, commercial property to a residential buyer. Yeah. And um, just through some research, uh, Craig discovered that um, on a quarter acre, yeah. zoned commercial highways like worth nothing. Right. If you get an acre, yeah. that's when like Royal Farms, Sheets, Ruby Tuesdays, those places will come in and just pay you whatever. So he's like, well, if we buy the three houses around it, we'll get an acre. Mm-hmm. So he started door knocking, cold calling, and we slowly bought each of the four properties around it and then sold it to, lo and behold, the car dealer 
they were going to put a new Suzuki dealership there. They wanted to buy it because they needed an acre of land to put a dealership. And it was directly across the street from their old dealership. And we made like a hundred grand, but we easily could have lost a hundred thousand dollars. But that was the first deal. Uh, and you guys were coming out of pocket with this money. Yeah. Well, Craig was. I yeah. I didn't have any money. We used his money, which was awesome for a very long time. So yeah, I was very fortunate. Plenty of it. Yeah. Yeah. He had plenty of it. So yeah, I was very fortunate that when we started in 2006 to be self-funded like that. Um, Cause we started like just making offers on the MLS and if they accepted, we would just close on it. I didn't have to worry about wholesaling it or assigning it or getting access. So. Um, 06 was a uh, pretty much kind of where we, uh, maybe last year. It was kind of like it felt like post COVID, okay, gotcha. like 2020, yeah, yeah. 2021. It was nuts. It was like a peak of a market, yeah. and then obviously 08 was coming around. Did anyone have? Were you prepared for that? Um, you know, I think that's because that, you know when when COVID happened and interest rates went up, everybody would say, "Hey, you know, the last time we felt something like this disrupting real estate, it was 2008." Yeah. And a couple of things I think worked our advantage. We were still so new that we were already learning anyway and building our business and making mistakes. So it's not like we had this like 10 year business model that now was completely disrupted. Right. So I think we were so nimble and so new and just worked at such a fast pace that as things changed, we just changed with it. Easy for you to. Yeah. To Number two, one of the biggest things, like when you strip away what happened in real estate, the, the, the real reason that, that real estate, residential real estate suffered is because nobody could get a mortgage, right? right? It, we went from like the easiest thing to do in 2007 was get a mortgage. Right. The hardest thing to do in 2008 was to get a mortgage. Yeah. And it's because there was this knee jerk reaction in the marketplace to all the fraudulent lending that was taking place prior to that, right? Yeah. And were you still a lender at this time? No. So no, when I, when I started working with Craig, I was yeah. out, right? Yeah. And this, this was my full-time thing. And, um, one of the other things we did is as people would come to us and apply to buy our homes mm -hmm. and they had like 650 credit scores and 15 grand down and literally couldn't get a mortgage, we would finance them. Craig's like, well, I'll finance them, take their 15 grand down. We'll do an installment sales agreement. And we ended up doing 200 installment sales agreements between like oh, yeah. 2008 Ooh, and 2000. <laughs> oh yeah, a lot. Like a Toyota dealership's not, yeah, 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 he that's, sold a Toyota that's a dealership. Deal. Yeah, it was a very big deal. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so we we uh, we would do a ton of installment sales agreements. Mm -hmm. um, we got really really good at finding lenders that were able to do tough deals that yeah. other banks couldn't do. Um, we basically fizzboed all of our flips. Wow. Um, we marketed the living snot out of it. Um, classified ads. Um, this is right when Facebook was actually coming out. You could okay. run. Remember, I would post a house on Facebook and boost it, and I would get like 30 buyer leads because you could target like a certain age. You could target like a certain area. Yeah. Now you can't do any of that stuff. Yeah. But um, yeah, we would we would FISBO. If we did, I don't know, by this time, 2009, we were doing 200 deals a year. We probably FISBOed 150 of them. That's crazy. Yeah. So kind of jumping into in like 06, just time frame, by 09, you're doing 200 deals a year. Yeah. So- what was kind of like the hardest part for you in scaling that amount? Was it, I think I have an idea. Construction was really, really hard. Yeah. Um, still is. Um, like we will, if we're lucky, we'll do 400 ish deals this year and 60 of those we'll do construction on. Still amazing. It's hard. Um, it's, it's, it's fulfilling like to take a house that's not in really good shape and, Nobody wants to live in it and renovate it and turn it into something super nice that people will raise a family in or call their primary home. Yeah. Um, but literally, like hiring contractors, managing contractors, um, you know, dealing with quality issues is really, really difficult. And I'm probably not naturally set up to be a, a great project manager. I'm more inclined to be a sales and marketing person. So I might struggle with construction a little bit more than other people. In the beginning, were you kind of trying to play all the roles or were you? Oh, yeah, I had to. Yeah, I mean, I was literally, um, you know, we would uh, generate, I don't know, we were doing TV and billboards and probably get 30 leads a month. And we had an answering service that would literally just answer the call, take like a one page application and then email it over to us. And of course, as soon as I got the email, I would pick up the phone and call. Yeah. Then I would attend all the acquisitions appointments. 
Um, so he didn't go on any appointments. He just brought the money and you did all the other side. I mean, he would do, you know, some work. He was in the office, but the majority, if not almost all of the acquisitions, dispositions, project management, um, lead management was all me. He just made sure we had enough money. If I bought a good deal, he made sure the money was there. And he would really handle like the back end, um, like business management of the P&L, the balance sheet. Um, he understood probably a little bit, but not probably much better than I did, like managing people. Um, I was just a guy that would push, 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 like call, call, call. Like I would help people close deals, but he was much better at, um, the actual leadership and management of people. Um, I was more like one of the guys that just happened to have a little bit more authority than everybody else, but he was a real leader. Are you guys still partners to? No, um, we're good friends. Um, but he, uh. Man, we so this is probably 2013, 14, 15. He lives in Baltimore. So he's driving up here, you know, sometimes two, two and a half hour round trip every day between getting here in the morning, getting back. And um, he just kind of got tired. He's like, hey, man, like, I don't necessarily want to be here every day. And when I'm not here, it's hard for me to manage, like, not knowing what's going on. Uh, why don't you buy the, the business? And I was like, what? I don't know what that means. Like, what do you mean by the business, right? And uh, he's like, well, well, we'll work out a deal. Like, we make X amount of dollars. I'll sell it to you for two times that. I'll help you borrow the money from the bank. I'll lend you half of the money and you can pay me back. And so we struck up a deal and I bought the business from him. We had like a five-year plan to pay him off. Um, I was able to pay him off in like two years. Um, And then he still had like $4 million in his own money in like projects and yeah. houses. And at this point now we have lines of credit with banks, but he had a bunch of equity in the deal. So I couldn't fully get him to exit from partnership until I replaced his 4 million bucks. Okay. So I bought the business plus I had to replace almost 4 million bucks in equity. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to every bank trying to borrow money. I've never owned a business before. And, uh, about three and a half, four years into our deal, um, I was able to pay him off fully, became sole owner, and um, yeah. And I became, that's when we changed from, in the beginning we were CR Property Group, yeah, I was gonna and say. then we rebranded as Integrity First. Yeah. Okay. So all the strategy I'm hearing now, it's a lot of active income, so wholesales, flips, and obviously innovation is something you ventured into. Are you keeping any of these properties as you're going? Um, yeah, I have. I've, uh, I've accumulated... Um, I got a spreadsheet back here, but it's probably uh, just over a hundred single family rentals. A few of those are like smaller multi-units. I own now two larger commercial deals, um, office buildings here in York. Um, and I still chat. I still try and buy, my goal is to buy about 25 rentals a year, but, um, I like to sell stuff. Like it's hard for me to keep a rental knowing that I can maybe wholesale it and make $40,000. So, um, and with the rates the way they are, it's, you know, it's difficult to make a, a rental work unless you get a really, really good deal. Um, so, yeah, I have about 100 single family doors, um, mostly in like York, Lancaster, Dauphin County. And I know you were just saying Investors United is based out of Baltimore. Was your car dealership down in Baltimore, too? Is that- no, it was here in York, um, right on Route 30. It's now called um, Toyota of York. But back then it was Deal Toyota, um, right on Route 30. And your partner lived in Baltimore that whole time? Yeah. I'm sure. So he was just driving up here every day for... Yeah. That's crazy. Dude's a beast. I've never seen anybody. Like, I always thought I was a hard worker, but mm-hmm. like, oh, man, yeah. he just... And he never missed a thing. Like, he was just one of those guys where, like, um, he just saw stuff, like, before everybody else did, right? Yeah. And uh, so it was awesome to be able to, to, you know, really grow up in business with him as my mentor. He told me everything I know about sales, um, he taught me, you know, how to hold people accountable, um, the value of being decisive and strong, um, when you lead people and, uh, so thankful for that experience. Cause he got me into the business, sold me the business and it's changed my life. Like, I don't know without him even pulling me into sales 20 years ago. You think you'd be where you are now? No, no. Yeah. Not a chance. So super thankful for him. When you started Integrity First Home Buyers, who was your first hire? And now that you're more experienced, like who would you hire first if it's different? Yeah, when I, by the time I bought the business, we already had 15 employees. Okay. So 
I know when, when me and Craig built the business and we realized that the two of us weren't able to keep up, um, we hired a project manager. Number one, that was the thing we liked the least, which was construction. Uh, two, we weren't very good at it. Um, and three, that would allow us to go sell more and buy more. So we hired a project manager, um, Cheryl Myers, actually. And uh, she ended up being our office manager for 17 years. But we originally hired her as a project manager. She was like a five foot two little blonde haired, <laughs> sweet old lady. I don't know what made uh, what made us believe she would be a great project manager, but um, <laughs> but she did a good job. She would she would drive around, check on all of our job sites, take detailed notes, send us pictures, and then uh, we quickly realized we needed someone to manage like office stuff. Like um, at this point now, we have lines of credit. Where there's settlements happening all the time. So we moved her into um, like an office manager uh, controller role and, and then hired another project manager. Um, I think our second hire was we hired like a lead manager to answer. You know, at this point, we're getting 25, 30 buyer leads a day and probably two to three seller leads a day. And it was just impossible for me to keep up with that. So we had someone that would answer the phones, kind of qualify sellers. And if it sounded like a good lead, they'd schedule an appointment for me to go to the house. And then we'd take all of our buyer leads, push them over to a mortgage broker to get them approved. And if they were approved, that would go show them a house to try and sell it to them. Gotcha. So it sounds like you're kind of, this might, this is going to change depending on who's running the business, but just kind of hire out your weakness first. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's a very good approach. So I think your question was, who would you hire today? Um, Like if you were starting over with the knowledge you have now. Um, I think honestly, I'd hire an executive assistant because, um, there's so much, I would say like low impact personal stuff that keeps us away from doing business. So the first thing I would do is get like no income producing activity off of my plate, which could be stuff like dry cleaning, um, fill my car up with gas, working my schedule, replying to emails, meal prep dry cleaning, cleaning your house, doing dishes, depending on whether you're married, you're single. Um, I would hire an executive assistant and get all of the non-income producing stuff off of my plate. Free up your time. A hundred percent. Then generally, um, I would say in the business, my first hire would be anything non-sales related. So if I'm doing construction, I'd get a project manager. um, And then someone probably to, if I'm generating leads to you know, handle a bulk of leads. And then I would only talk to qualified people. Okay. And we've done our research. So, you know, like when you start to hire out, you want to make sure you're hiring the right person for the right job. Huh. So, yeah, I wanted to get into like the personality yeah. test. Yeah, right, I'm going to. Yeah. There's a ask for every seat. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're not used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. When, when you would say like, um, you know, I'd be like, who the heck would want to like, you know, uh, do demo on a house. And he'd be like, well, there's an ass for every seat. I did do demo, but you know, there, every job that we dislike that, um, we can't stand, there's a person that their personality and skill set yeah. is a great fit for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was another good piece of advice I got from my dad. Mm-hmm. Sounds like a wise man. He is. He is. Yeah. He's given me some good advice along the way. So that's awesome. Thanks for passing it down. Yeah. And do you do personality tests for every employee? Oh, yeah. I won't talk to anybody about working here unless I know what they're predicting. Really? Oh, yeah. Could you guess what you think ours would be? Um, for DISC. Do you do, you do DISC? So DISC is the same as PI. Just DISC uses D-I-S-C. Yeah. So dominance, um, introverted or extroverted, S is pace, and C is um, like rigidness or process. Mm-hmm. And PI, it's A, B, C, D, but it literally measures the same thing. Okay. So we took the DISC one. Okay. Um, generally because you're entrepreneurs, you would have a higher D like for the most part, um, both of you are comfortable on camera. So you have a higher I probably a low S, which means you work at a fast pace. And I don't know which one of you, if which one of you would handle like details. So you probably have a higher C than he does. So yeah, she's more of a IS. Yeah. I'm, I'm IS. It's a very personable wheel. Yeah. You don't have to be dominant. Um, you're more collaborative. I'm like introvert, extrovert, so I can be both. Situationally flexible. Yeah. I am ID. Oh, wow. That's an interesting combo. Well, yeah, because normally when you have high I, you love people, and high D is data, and generally data and people don't go together. It's funny because just even bringing it up like that, it's like, no, I actually, I can relate to enjoying both of them. 
Like even outside of that, it's like I can love the numbers. I love diving deep into it, but at mm -hmm. the same time, I love building the relationships and the connections. Like yeah, it's cool because when when you know that stuff about people, it it gives you um, basically the ability to predict how they'll do in a job, right? Because if you if you have someone that's a a low eye, what points this way, where both of you have more of a dominant eye, it means you're comfortable with people. You gain energy from being around people. Someone that has a low eye, it literally exhaust them to have to talk to them. So you shouldn't put that person in a sales position. Like you have a high D, mine like points left off of the paper. Like I don't, oh, I could care less about rules and regulations. Like everything's negotiable to me. So you shouldn't put me in, a, I am a maverick. So a maverick in PI looks like this. It's like my assertiveness points off the the charts and my, my D points this way. So I'm like the, yeah, it's literally like Maverick, like the little icons, like the, the Top Gun yeah. airplane, yeah. the guy that like flies past the, the communications tower when he's not supposed to. Yeah, that's me. So I go 80 miles an hour in a 45. <laughs> I don't wear my seatbelt. Yeah, it's, it's um, I do wear my seatbelt, by the way, if my mom's watching. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm a rogue Maverick that uh, likes to push the boundaries, move at an alarming pace, and could care less about details or... What was the name of that test? Predictive index. So DISC is really, really good. They say that it's generally uh, at or around 50% accurate. Predictive index they found is around 70% accurate. So uh, we have a license for it. It's really... I can send it to you. You guys can take it. Oh, does it cost money too? To... Uh, I pay about... Um, well, you wouldn't have to pay anything. I'd send you my license, but I spend, I spend about $7,000 a year to have a license for it. And it, it also gives you like people management. So we have 43 employees. Yeah. So I can put all of my employees together. Like, let's say the two of you work together. I'm like, are they going to be able to work together? So I can put your two profiles together and it'll give me a report of where you may struggle, where your strengths would align, which projects you would work well on. So it's a great management tool, not just like a recruiting or interviewing tool. Cool. Yeah. If I interview you for a sales job, I can put your profile in there yeah. and it'll give me interview questions to ask you to clarify whether or not you'd be a great fit. It's an amazing tool. Like we, we don't, when people apply, the first thing they have to do when they apply here is fill out a predictive index behavioral assessment. That's yeah. awesome. I've given them to all my family, my, oh yeah. Family too? Oh yeah. <laughs> my wife, <laughs> my wife's like literally <laughs> the opposite of me. She is super collaborative and wants details for everything like she has our budget built out for the next six years six years oh yeah she's got <laughs> details she has a calendar up on the wall that has every basketball practice every vacation well that's good because you have a big family too yeah but i don't do any of that yeah i literally like <laughs> no i don't i don't do any of that detail stuff so it's pretty it's pretty interesting yeah. did you um see that from ty lopez because i know he's like huge with like the personality type. Yeah, but no, I forget. Someone along the way introduced me to it. It was a, um, I think I hired like a headhunter or something okay. to hire a, a job um, or hire a position. And they were adamant about using this software and then showed it to me. And I was like, oh, wow. Because yeah. without that, you're just guessing. Like, right. you know, someone could lie on a resume. They can BS their way through an interview. Mm -hmm. And I remember like back when I was hiring project managers to do construction, I would hire people you like yeah. well People generally like you. yes well i don't want to hire someone like me to do construction they're just going to mess it up like i do like you know, so i burned through like three project managers i was like john's a nice guy why is he not doing a good job because <laughs> he literally is not detailed like me yeah. and everything has to be done immediately so he rushes through stuff and then you end up with projects that are you know um rushed through the quality's not right the budget's out of whack um, so yeah, just slowly over time, I realized how important it was and now it's non-negotiable. Yeah. Well, also definitely implement that when it comes to hiring. No, people. for sure. I wish I could give them the customers. Yeah. I wish I could see what their behavioral profile <laughs> was. Cause, well, it would help you. Yeah. And then one of the things you get better at doing is after you do it for so long, you'll get to pick up on people's tendencies and you'll modify mm -hmm. how you communicate with them, whether it's in a sales conversation or an interview. Mm -hmm. So it's been super helpful. That's awesome. So right now, like how many total employees do you have? 43. 43. Yeah. And when you went into COVID, you had 42. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it was pretty important to me not to, to lay people off yeah. when COVID hit. And um, we were just talking about Dana White, and that was one of his main goals, too, with yeah. the whole UFC. He was like, I just want to get through this without having to lay off any of my team. Yeah. 
So yeah, because it was it was already a scary time, right? Just not knowing what was actually happening with, you know, our health and 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 you know, at that point you're worrying about dying. It's like, oh, hey, by the way, you don't have a job either. Yeah. And and the reality is, in the beginning, when most people were laying staff off, we didn't really know what was going to happen. And the reality, if you think back, I mean, really, just like restaurants were probably the people that were most impacted because they couldn't open. Right. And, you know, it paid off because while other people in real estate laid mm-hmm. off 30, 40, 50 percent of their staff, mm-hmm. as soon as the restrictions were lifted, the market went bananas yeah. and all of our staff were already there. I remember I would spend $60,000 a month on TV ads. Mm-hmm. And when COVID hit, my bill went like to half yeah. wow. because everybody pulled out of television advertising. Mm-hmm. So we were getting, I mean... Deals were just falling into our lap left and right because we were literally the only people yeah. in business. Right. Everybody else kind of pulled back. They stopped sending advertising dollars. They laid off all their personnel. And we almost, like, once I realized that was happening and we were still doing deals, we'd, like, doubled down. Yeah. And uh, it's paid off. We, had, we captured a lot of market share, and some of those people never came back into business. Mm-hmm. Um, some people haven't been able to hire replacements for the good people they lost, so... Yeah, I was super thankful that we made that decision early on. And it was scary because, you know, you didn't know uh, we weren't allowed to go in home. So we were doing everything virtual and we yeah. in person. Yeah. We uh, we got it. We actually one of the things we did is I I um, applied for a waiver okay. to the governor. There's a waiver process where um, remember they announced like a um, they had a list. And if your business was considered essential. You could operate. If it wasn't essential, you had to close down. Yeah. So real estate was not essential. However, we applied for a waiver and got approved. So um, I pointed out that we supply affordable housing. Over 50% of my rentals are Section 8. Um, so if we're not renovating and renting properties, like where... So hopefully that, you know, we're, I guess maybe that paid off, but... Shelter is essential. So, which, but it should have been real estate should have been essential to begin with, but, uh, no, we got, we got a copy of the, the, the waiver. Um, every project manager had like a copy in their truck. Every acquisitions agent had a copy in their car. It was posted all over her office because if uh, once or twice people came to the office and be like, Hey, you can't be here. I'm like, Hey, we got a waiver. It was kind of crazy. (laughs) Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we were very fortunate to, to not only survive through COVID, but, um, we had some amazing months. Um, and, uh, at that point we were in the turnkey business, which we don't do a lot of now. I wanted to bring that up too, actually. Yeah. So we, we, we sold, uh, over 50% of the deals we were doing, we were selling to investors across the country. Yeah. Yeah. So they didn't need to see the property. They didn't come to, to, to tour it. They didn't need a showing. Um, we just had to renovate it, provide a home inspection and have a tenant in it. And they would buy us, right. buy every property. So I'm going to say, like, Stephanie and myself, we've been doing this for a little while. And I don't know about you, but this is an all-new strategy to me. It's Burr basically key. Burr, yeah. but instead of the last R, it is Burr key. Right. So you can call it Burr key, right, where you buy, renovate, rent, sell to them, and they get it turnkey. So, and most of our clients were, like, West Coast where, you know, like, the average price of a home in California is, like, $700,000. Yeah. Washington State is, like, $700,000. So they... They live out there and make three hundred thousand dollars, but they can't invest in real estate in their home state because of the prices. None of them cash flow. And so, not only yeah. that, but a good cash on cash return out there is typically like six to ten percent at highest. Yeah. And around here, you're offering people thirteen to sixteen yeah. percent typically. Yeah. Well, when, especially when rates were four percent. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were absolutely killing it with turnkeys, and uh, the investors were making out because they were buying. Hundred and thirty thousand dollar row homes that were renting for fifteen hundred, borrowing money at four percent, they were getting twelve to fifteen yeah. percent returns. And now, all of those people that bought those in 2019, 2020, 2021, even twenty twenty two, mm-hmm. their property values went up fifteen twenty percent in yeah. three four years. Yeah. So we've had a lot of those investors that bought in like twenty 2020, twenty twenty one that sold, and property value went up forty fifty sixty grand. Right. So they're pretty happy. And this is an argument I actually have with a lot of people because I have buddies who are investors as well, not necessarily in real estate, but other ventures. And they always ask me, like, why Harrisburg? Why why aren't you moving to Florida or like a more a hot market per se? And I always tell them, I was like, honestly, we're specifically in Harrisburg. I mean, we do venture out a little bit, but I always tell them, I was like, typically whenever you're investing in real estate, depending on your location, you're either 
going for cash flow, you're going for appreciation. It's rare to have the opportunity of getting both. I feel like that's something that we're very blessed to have, at least in our location, because like you said, we are seeing the appreciation and yet the cash on cash return just from the cash flow alone is higher than a lot of other markets. I agree. Um, the one thing I've noticed though, is that like the bigger the market, the bigger the returns from a flipping and wholesaling perspective. Uh, I was just at a mastermind recently as a young man that stood up on stage and gave a presentation about his business the last three months, and he's making $180,000 per wholesale deal. Wow. Per wholesale? Yeah. What's your wholesale? <laughs> San Francisco. Okay, okay. That makes sense. And um, nice guy, mm -hmm. not the most organized, sophisticated businessman. Yeah. I'm literally looking at him like, you're making $188,000 per wholesale deal when we make $26,000? Um, That's so yeah, we are actively considering now picking like two major metro markets to go in, um, to wholesale and novate with that specific in mind. Novating in another market that big, that could be huge. So, I mean, if you go to 700, $800 million yeah. markets and novate where there's 15% spread, I mean, you're making 200 grand. So, and I've taught it now to enough people, uh, I think it's almost 500 people, investors that I've taught it to across the country. There's people in California, Idaho, um, Washington State, Southern uh, Florida that are literally making a hundred grand on innovation deals because they're, they're doing seven, $800,000 transactions yeah. Yeah. and the spread's just bigger. I mean, the risk is bigger, but um, you know, the bigger risk, the bigger reward. So are you a high risk taker? Would you yeah, my, my yeah, my profile would indicate that I'm. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. So there is a. I wanted to ask you, like, who introduced you into innovations? Uh, my attorney, Brad Leber. So remember, I was telling you in 2008, as the market unfolded, lending got really difficult. Yeah. So prior to 2008, uh, you could get literally a loan no matter your credit, no matter your down payment, it was like the easiest thing in the world. So when the market changed, all of those loan products went away. And really the only way you could get a mortgage back then was FHA. Right. So now I have all of these flips and every buyer that wants to buy it is an FHA buyer. Well, the problem is, is that FHA has deed seasoning, so they can't even write it 90 days. Yeah. Um, I was accustomed to flipping houses in 30 days. Now I can't even write a contract for 90 days. Yeah. Plus, as the, the market was unfolding and they were uh, learning more and more about all of the mortgage fraud that was out there, mm -hmm. if an FHA buyer was buying a flip that I bought for 100 and I was selling for 200 the underwriter would just look for a reason to kill the deal. That's what they did with basically with us. 100%. Yeah. Now you got to imagine in 2009, it was like, even crazy. Oh, yeah. like the worst thing you could do yeah. is be a flipper mm -hmm. and sell your house to an FHA buyer where you're making a lot of money. Didn't matter what you rented. They just saw it and they were like, no way. We got to figure out a reason to turn it down. Right. Um, on top of just normal lending was really tough. Like they were super sticklers about income. They were, if you were on your job a year and 11 months instead of two years, denied. Wow. Um, if you couldn't um, document where your down payment came from through six months worth of bank statements, denied. So I just started freaking out because I used to sell all of these properties as soon as they were flipped, right? And now I get all this FHA stuff. So I started working with my attorney to try and figure out like how we could Maneuver. fix it. Yeah. And that's where he brought to my attention um, the legal aspect of novating, but nobody at that point had ever done it in wholesale real estate. Yeah. It's really popular in like commercial real estate. It's really popular in like government contracts where let's say the government wants to build a highway mm -hmm. and you're a general contractor and you win the bid, but right. then you novate the concrete, the Stephanie's company. Oh. It's kind of like subcontracting, right? Yeah. Yeah. But in contract law, it's called novating. Yeah. And he explained it to me and I was like, I barely graduated high school, bro. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. He's like, but you know, the, the, the seasoning happens when you record the deed and if you don't record the deed. And so I kind of understood it, but I wasn't sure what to do with it. And lucky enough, um, in 2008, the government passed an FHA flip waiver. So what happened is they recognized that all this bad bank owned short sale foreclosure inventory was flooding the market. Yeah. And the only people that would buy it would be investors. Yeah. 
but investors aren't going to buy it if they can't sell it. So they said, hey, FHA people will buy this. Why aren't you selling to FHA buyers? And we're like, well, because there's seasoning and there's all this. So they lifted FHA seasoning. And now I could buy your house today for a hundred grand and sell it to Stephanie on an FHA loan for 200 with no seasoning. Yeah. It just required two appraisals, which was a pain in the butt yeah. and a home inspection. Like it had to pass a home inspection to make sure there wasn't any major defects. Mm -hmm. So we were golden for two years. That flip waiver expired in 2010. And that's when I really dug into innovations, started building out like how to apply it to our whole. You know, was that like early on 2010? Dang. But you just started getting loud about it. Like three years ago, I started teaching it. I went to a um, real estate mastermind and once a quarter you go and twice a year, each person has to get up and present. You have to teach somebody something or share with the group something that you're doing that they would get benefit from. And I was like, well, what are we going to teach? I don't know. And I'll teach innovations. And I did that, and everybody's mind was, oh, yeah, it was crazy. You're known as the Novation yeah. guy. It started in um, Tampa three years ago. I presented in a room full of, like, 200 people, and I just got bum-rushed in the hallway. And um, a friend of mine, Steve Trang, uh, was like, dude, you need to monetize this. And I was like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. What do you mean? He's like, well, I have a podcast. I can set up a course. I do sales training. So I partnered with Steve Trang. We built a Novations uh, education platform, started selling it, and now here we are three years later and he's 500 the, people. That's the real estate disruptor? Yeah. He's got like the second largest real estate podcast in the wow. world. Yeah. yeah. He's been around for a long time, and he runs a, uh, he does a, a sales, he does sales coaching as well. So. You were on Bigger Pockets too, weren't you? That's awesome. How was that? Um, I didn't realize like the magnitude of what it was until the episode came out, and I probably got... 20 phone calls and text messages from people that were like, dude. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was pretty cool. I mean, they run uh, like just the whole experience. Now they reflect back on it. Like there was like a show to prepare for the show. Oh, really? oh yeah. They took me through like 50 questions and I was like, Oh, that was an awesome podcast. And I'm like, no, this isn't the, they're like, this isn't the podcast. <laughs> That's a month from now. This is like our basically pre-show. No yeah. Um, Another goal we have is to eventually get on one of their podcasts. Yeah, that'd be. Yeah, it was uh, it was a pretty cool experience. Um, so yeah, I was very blessed to be on it. I remember like watching it when it first came out, and I was like, "Yo, why the f Eric Blue is on here?" Like, what? <laughs> I I seriously, I mean, I knew of Bigger Pockets, but um, I never really spent a ton of time on there and didn't realize like the magnitude of the following that they had like, until I was on there. Yeah, I was a Bigger Pockets like connoisseur. It was like every episode, I was waiting by the minute, like yeah. refreshing the page. I was like, "Come on, come on." <laughs> Because I was, uh, for the past two, little over two years now, two years, a couple months, I've been working at a warehouse, TE Connectivity, over in Mechanicsburg. Yeah. And while I'm there, like, there's this little platform. I drive a forklift, so I have, like, this little platform. I stick my phone on, and I'll flip it upside down so nobody can see. Yeah. I have my AirPods. I'll wear a beanie that, like, covers my entire yeah. ears because they'll flip out for, like, safety reasons yeah. whatnot. So it's just bigger pockets 24-7 going. Really? There's that much stuff to listen to? Oh, my God. There's, like, oh, they got 900 so episodes yeah. just on one uh, one podcast series but they have so many other series now that they've added on to it right and it's a podcast or a show every single day That's awesome. so yeah. it's freaking crazy it was like so much knowledge just over that period of time it's like yeah, yeah I, I absolutely loved it awesome. but there was something else i wanted to ask you about well before we get into i want to talk about numbers oh, oh go ahead sorry, you, you know it so go I ahead go. um how well, we were just on innovations but mm -hmm. there was something earlier on that was similar to innovations but is illegal uh net listing is that what it's called mm -hmm. what, what is that so a net so a net listing is if you're a real estate agent yeah. and you meet with a seller and they say hey i want two hundred thousand dollars for my house you sign a net listing agreement that says they get two hundred thousand as the agent your commission is anything you sell for over that mm -hmm. okay. so the basic concept is sort of like that because when you novate a house, you negotiate a price with the seller. The seller is guaranteed the contract price that you agree to, yeah. and you'll take it to the open market and sell it to a retail buyer, and you get anything over that. The difference is, is an agent is charging a commission. An investor novating is creating equity and spread. Gotcha. So in most states, net listings are not permitted. Um, and, uh, you know, even the, the, where they are, I think there's this, you know, when you're a real estate agent and obviously commissions are under heavy scrutiny right now. Yeah. So if 6% is not cool and you're an, a, a real estate agent, you do a net listing and you make 30%, <laughs> yeah. 
like I think the precedent's already been set that there's there's a, a reasonable expectation for what a real estate commission is worth, and they just they literally just handed down like a half a billion dollar lawsuit yeah. in regards to that. So uh, you never know. I mean, that listings might remain like they're they're of all places in California they're legal. Like the most litigious state yeah. in the entire country that doesn't permit anything. Um, there's a couple guys that I know that do uh, novations and do net listings, and net listings in California are still legal. But yeah, so no, novations are basically, um, you know, a, a, a wholesale strategy to a retail buyer, and a net listing is an agent relationship with the consumer where they get a commission uh, for anything over and above what the seller had agreed to. Now, do you think it's okay for an agent to list like a novation and, okay. Yeah, as long as they disclose, um, you know, if you're a licensed agent and you sit with a seller and you negotiate a purchase price, um, the only thing that you need to be sure you do is disclose two things. One, I'm a licensed agent. Um, Like we use a one page, 75% of our people are licensed. And it says, I am an agent. I'm an expert you're at a disadvantage because I'm an expert. Like it's in bold letters, right? It gets over disclosed. Yeah. However, I'm not here today acting as a real estate agent. I am here acting as an investor. And it basically says like seller beware. Okay. And um, so we have all of our clients sign That's that so when they, we, yeah, I mean, it's like, Hey, you can't say that we didn't disclose or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's perfectly acceptable. However, when you're an agent, you're under a different amount of scrutiny about, Um, what would jeopardize your license and how you can behave that way. So anytime we have someone that's licensed, meet with a seller, we over disclose. But as long as you do that, you can, you can buy a novation, list a novation. And your company still, you know, in play. Oh gosh. Disclosed. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to get into numbers. So in regards to like, let's just say average with wholesaling, flipping, everything, like what would you say an average monthly income is for you? Gross or net? Uh, Let's do both. So we do, um, our projections are about 27 deals before commissions in central PA, Mm -hmm. which we cover seven counties. So from like here, Lancaster, Dauphin, Cumberland, um, Adams, Lebanon, like central PA. Mm -hmm. Um, Our goal is to do 27 transactions a month at $26,000 per transaction works out to be just over $600,000 okay. gross profit. Then we have another market in like uh, Philadelphia suburbs yeah. that we started last year. Our goal there is um, $100,000 $100, a month in gross profit. So combined, it's about seven hundred. And then our expectations are that we should net 35%. So a good month, we would do 700000 and net about $230,000 profit. Now, with... Yeah, it really is. And with those numbers, like, do you ever think about with you having a big overhead of 43 employees, having this big office, do you ever think about, man, I could have like three employees, you know, people overseas have it like super cheap. Do you think about that? Yeah, I just, I did that. And I didn't like the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Um, I literally in this core business probably work uh, four to five hours a week and yeah and the company nets i mean this this year we should net three million bucks Mm -hmm. and you know so i and then you know the other part is you know so it's more sustainable like i remember um back when i did everything even though the income would be good it would be like this like, you know, you would go from hero one month to zero the next. And the reason is, is when you're, when you have three people and they work overseas, the quality and quantity of work that could get done is very limited. So in this business, normally what happens is we're hyper-focused on acquisitions, right? Till we get a deal. Then we stop focusing on acquisitions and then we switch to selling our deal, which takes two, three weeks, right? Then we sell it. We're like, yeah but we haven't done any prospecting or acquisitions for three weeks. So now we're back to square one. We have no pipeline. So when you're trying to wear three or four hats, there really is no such thing as multitasking. It really should be called switch tasking where you can't do three things at once. You can do one thing, stop it, start another one, stop it, start another one. So, um, yeah, I don't know that, you know, some days when, you know, overheads high and, um, expenses are demanding. I wonder what it would be like to, to have less of an obligation, but I've done both. Yeah. And while there's a certain simplicity to running small and lean, 
uh, the upside is pretty limited. Like, you know, we have the ability to do, I mean, I think this year we can have a million dollar month. And if, uh, yeah, I mean, and that means we would net $400,000 a month. So my hopes are that I'm building a, a, you know, a $5 million net company and we're maybe one market away from that. You can't do 5 million bucks net profit with two VAs and wearing three hats. So are you still, so is your future plans then to continue to branch out into different markets? Um, I'll give, go over this one. I will give, yeah, I will give (laughs) our people the ability to, to choose whether or not they do that. Okay. I'm currently working on, um, one doing more large multifamily and commercial deals. And that requires me to be in different rooms. I have to have syndication or a little bit of both. Yeah. I have a, a partner of mine who has a wall street background and runs a fund and he's got a tremendous amount of experience in analyzing deals and funding deals. So like I made an offer on a 198 unit apartment building here in York two weeks ago, he would single-handedly oversee the funding of that project. I would play no part in it. Um, so I've hired a commercial acquisitions agent that has 12 years worth of experience in syndication deals. Um, he's done some large seller finance deals where he bought entire resorts and golf courses with seller financing. Cool. So, um, we're very active in that. We have, um, two projects right now. One's a 80 unit, um, you know, the old M and T, um, uh, headquarters on Derry Street in Harrisburg. I bought that building. So we're putting in yeah, 80 condominiums in there. Uh, yeah. Uh, it'll be called Capital Flats. It's dope. Did you have struggle with like the city at all? Oh, I didn't do anything. I, I, yeah, I don't have anything to do with it. No. My, my primary function in any of my businesses is to um, be like the outward facing spokesperson create meaningful relationships with potential customers, potential partners, potential vendors and bankers, and then literally all of the operations I'm completely removed from. So yeah, we have a person that will oversee operations, construction, funding, financing, property management, and then eventually when it's time to exit it, they'll oversee that. I literally just bring groups of people together, not even parts, just people. And then the people that I bring together manage the parts. Um, it's what I was intended to do. If I start talking about a house or a deal or an ARV, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I, I try and make my focus people and, uh, it's paid off mm-hmm. big time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't have the energy to learn multifamily right now. Yeah. Um, I don't have the energy to, to learn land entitlement. I don't have the, the energy to learn how to do syndication deals, but I do have the energy to find someone that knows how to do it and get them to come work for me and then just treat them good enough that they don't ever want to leave. Yeah. Have you ever looked into de- development? Yeah. yeah. Have you done any? Um, we've done smaller where I bought like small parcels of land. We just sold one today. Um, where it was like five acres. Um, we got it approved for like six building lots okay. and sold it off to someone that's going to develop it. Um, so we've done a little bit of land entitlement. So you just got it approved. You didn't go through like actually subdividing. Okay. Um, we've done uh, new construction where I've bought like half acre lots and built a duplex on it, sold those to turnkey buyers. I did eight or 10 of those projects. And how was that experience for you? Um, it, cool. Like to take a piece of dirt and then yeah. like, oh, four months later, there's like a duplex there is pretty sick. Yeah, that's super. And it's new construction versus, you know, when you're working with rehabs and renos, um, the nature of the contractor you work with, it's a little challenging. New construction, it's like legit. In this area, like Amish dudes that show up early, work late, and it's done in like a day. Yeah. So, and, um, you know, they'll do it for a reasonable price. So we we built, I don't know, 15 or so duplexes. Um, when the rates were really low, we were killing it, selling those to turnkey investors. I built them for 350 and sell them for 550 um, But as rates creeped up and material costs... <laughs> I was yeah. building them for 450 and they were only worth 400 So I have two of them now that I kept, and I have them as uh, midterm rentals. Okay. Uh, but they're doing really well. I built them for 400 and some change. Um, we rent them midterm for like 3500 a door. So I'm in it for 450 and they generate seven grand a month in gross rents. They're awesome. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so we, we've done a little bit of everything, but never like big development deals. One of the other deals we're doing with my partners that we have in that, um, 
Harrisburg project they were converting to condos is like a 250 unit townhome development in Columbus, Ohio. Bought it from a struggling developer that ran out of money, already got through a land entitlement, had all of the approvals, is just ready to be built. Yeah. And we bought it for a really good price. Right, you can just raise the capital for it. Yeah. Yeah. And then we'll partner with a builder out there, build it, stabilize it, rent it, refinance, pay off our partners, and keep it. So it's crazy. Like that deal, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, we should. I mean, we should make eight to 10 million bucks in three years. So like doing that kind of stuff, what's that? Are you documenting like? Um, you know, it's a good question. I don't think it's currently set up to be that way, but yeah, it would be great to to document how it got started and what it looks like to, to finish it up. But yeah, I mean, that stuff gets me excited to work on bigger deals like that yeah. requires a little patience because they can take two, three, four years, but, yeah. um, you know, four years from now, someone shows up here and drops off a $4 million check. I won't be just... You ain't complaining? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that stuff. So. Amazing, nice. So do you have any main goals for this year? Um, yeah, so the, the other thing that, that I'm looking at is... Um, so I have six kids. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And I've been working on... Do you know what a BHAG is? No. It's called a Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal. Um, if you want to read a really good business book, um, a guy named Jim Collins wrote a book, Good to Great. And he talks about like great companies all had this big goal that seemed unrealistic, yeah. but it serves as like this North star that they point towards and it creates them to push the envelope of what's possible. It inspires people that work for them. It inspires their customers. Like, do you know, Microsoft 35 years ago, they had a goal of putting a laptop or a computer. On everybody's desk. Yeah. Now crazy 30 years ago, that sounded ridiculous. Yeah. Matter of fact, when they said that they didn't even make computers. Yeah. So it was like, why people are like, you're crazy. doesn't seem crazy anymore, right? Um, so my big, hairy, audacious goal is to have six businesses all netting $2 million a year, one for each of my children. Oh, that's awesome. And what I would hope is that across those six businesses, there would be enough diversity, like in niche and industry, that if my daughter likes marketing, my other daughter likes graphic design, my other daughter, God love her, maybe she likes project management. Lily seems to have like this weird interest in like, design and like construction it's she's crazy girl and uh yeah so i would hope that i have six businesses that you know i have a say and some type of impact over the culture and the way that people are treated and they would have the opportunity to start at the ground level and you know work at a place that they um care about that they know that people are going to take good care of them and yeah so that's what i'm working towards i want to i want to own um six businesses that net two million bucks a year how many businesses are you at now so just you're at three Okay, what would those be? So I own a construction, or not construction, I'm sorry, commercial real estate business. Um, I mean, we're quickly on our path to get the $2 million. I have a rental portfolio, and I have a flipping and wholesale business. Gotcha. Wow. So, okay. So what would be the other three that you would add on? I don't know. Um, I'm I'm watching, um, there's a guy right now that I've, I've been introduced to that um, shows you how to basically um, wholesale businesses. Okay. His name's Kyle Malian. He's out of San Diego, California. Um, I signed up for his course. I met him and had dinner with him uh, six months ago when I was um, in California. And it's basically the same principle as what we do in real estate. You find a business that has potential, right, but it needs renovated. So generally, this is a business that might be owned by someone that's correct. They don't have systems, processes, probably haven't updated their website in 25 years or might not have one. Um, the family doesn't want to take it over. And the problem is, is that they are the primary breadwinner in the business. So if you remove them, the business, mm -hmm. goes with the business would shut down. Yeah. So it's not a sellable business, right? Much like what a lot of people would say about a wholesale business, it's not sellable. Well, that's not completely accurate until it's automated. So if you build your real estate and wholesale business, it's very sellable. So what you do is you look for mom and pop outdated businesses that are owned by people that are looking to retire. They don't have family that they can hand it down to. And generally what you'll do is you'll, you'll take a business, let's say, that nets a million bucks a year. You buy it for $2 million. You increase it to a $4 million business through innovation, sales, marketing, leadership, adding people, development of new products. And then it'll sell at a five multiple. So you can buy it for two, sell it for 20. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you do that, like how many of those the multiples of you hire someone that understands how to do it and is an expert <laughs> at it? Yeah. Okay. So literally, but the, the multiples are dictated by um, like market category. So like a software business 
typically sells at a higher multiple, right? It's called a, a SaaS or software as a service product. They typically sell at a higher margin. Um, you know, so each industry has sort of a precedent that's been established as to what they'll sell for. Um, but each business, you know, amount of cash that you have, um, reoccurring income is another big one. If you don't like in, in real estate, we got to go back out every month and find new deals where if you have a rental portfolio, one of the reasons rentals sell at a certain multiple is because it's reoccurring income. You don't have to re-rent the property every month, right? Um, so you're saying if you were to like sell your entire portfolio, somebody would just buy that at a multiple predicting that it's going to go up in the future and having the reoccurring revenue. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I want to learn uh, more about buying and wholesaling and yeah. scaling businesses. That'd be super cool. You ever yeah. look into like Cody Sanchez? Same thing. So yeah. Cody Sanchez does basically the identical thing that Kyle Mallon buy boring businesses. Like his big thing last time I saw him was buying pest control businesses. Uh, you can scale them really quick. Um, they have reoccurring income because you sign up for like a pest contract. They come spray your house once a year. You forget that it even exists, but it just <laughs> comes right off your credit card. 100%. And um, he was telling me a couple guys that like scaled these pest companies and sold them to like, um, I forget what he was saying, but it was like other businesses that, that are in um, like the home services business, like maybe they own a couple HVAC companies, they own a roofing company, and it was right in line with that. And they were selling at like 10 multiples. So if they were netting 2 million bucks a year, they were selling a pest control company for 20 million bucks. That's See, wild. That is wild. That's crazy. Awesome. Now, I do want to get into books because I know you love reading and you're talking about multitasking and how you can't do that. And that made me think of Gary Keller, The One Thing. Yeah. I don't know. Have you read that? So what would you say your top, like, three books out of all the books you read? Yeah, I think there's, um, it's tough because, like, if you were to do, like, one business book, one real estate book. I think everything I read is real estate. So I just read this book recently, and it, it changed. A lot of what you're hearing from me today is because of this book. It's called 10X is Easier Than 2X. Um, that would be up there. Um, seven Habits of Highly Effective People. It's literally like a blueprint. Like if you do these seven things, mm -hmm. you'll be successful. It's, it's not super. Books. It's amazing, right? It's super simple. Atomic Habits. I read that, yeah. Amazing book. Really book. Um, I think from business, uh, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a really, really good book to read. As soon as you start to add people and you're responsible for managing people, that's a pretty um, pivotal book when it comes to running a business. Okay. Um, but those would probably be my top four or five um, if I stick another one in there, I would say two of them by the same author that wrote 10X is Easier Than 2X. It's called The Gap and the Gain. You did tell me about that. The, the basically the art of constantly living in a state of gratitude. Yeah. And uh, he's found that over the, this guy studied like thousands of entrepreneurs that uh, super successful people always maintain the state of gratitude. They always say, why is this happening for me? Not why is it happening to me? Because the opposite of that is living in a uh, an attitude of entitlement, yeah. which isn't going to get you far, right? And then the other book that he wrote was Who Not How. Yeah. Amazing book, right? It's like, hey, when you're procrastinating something, you're too worried about how to do it. Instead, what you should do is figure out who can do it for you. Yeah. That really pivots. That's why I say, hey, my job is just find the who, not the how. Yeah. So I don't get caught up in the details. I just go, hey, if I want to do that, if I want to buy businesses, I'll just become friends with Cody Sanchez or Kyle Malian. Yeah. So, and oddly enough, um, the first guy that rented space above us, he's a local business broker. Yeah. Fate would have it. hundred yeah. percent. So I actually, starting next week, I, I spend two hours every week and mentor with him upstairs. Wow. So he's mentoring me. So I'll go up there and I'm just going to yeah. take it all in. But he's literally, he's like the real estate agent to businesses. Yeah. So when someone wants to sell their businesses, he's generally the guy that they call. Yeah. You never let stop us know. learning. Hey, let us know if you hear anything interesting. Yeah. Love to hear. Yeah. It's, um, he brought me a business last week it didn't work out but uh it was a a custom uh like woodworking business where they make like nightstands and like little tables like this and they sell them on etsy yeah yeah and they make like six hundred thousand dollars a year the, the, oh yeah it's wild and uh they sell everything on etsy there's no other they don't they don't retail anything everything get, but etsy takes like 40 percent Oh, that's a huge forty percent. Yeah. yeah. So he was like, "Hey, if you can figure out a platform to sell your own stuff, your profits instantly go up by forty percent." Yeah, yeah. The it's problem the was line. the problem is the only two guys that do the woodworking are the owners that want to sell. Mm. Oh, well, that, that's not a business. No, 
So, you know, I was like, hey, if they stay on for two years, I'll buy it. You sell or finance it for two years. And once we hit a million dollars um, and I can hire two people to replace you, I'll bounce. And they're like, ah, we'll just shut it down. They just closed it down. But it was interesting, a woodwork, custom woodworking business. Who would even think that that's a thing, right? Yeah. Made back in the day. I don't know about not now, but it is. Yeah, they make stuff like this. Yeah, like 3D printers now and everything it's else. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. I know we're coming to a close here, but I do want to touch on, because we talked about like fasting and stuff yeah. and like faith. Oh. And I know recently it has been a big impact on your life uh, from your son introducing you to everything and to like going to church and stuff. So maybe touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I um so I grew up in the church. My my family um on my dad's side was Catholic, my mom's side was Methodist. Mm-hmm. And um there was a lot of turmoil in my family uh as I was a kid, a lot of divorce, a lot of alcoholism, a lot of verbal abuse, some physical abuse. Nothing crazy, but enough where you watch that as a kid and I'm going to church and I'm watching my parents and I'm watching these people say one thing. And then when I get home, it's a completely different experience. So I think when I was old enough as an adult to to develop my own opinion, um, I was like, church people are hypocrites. You go to church and you say all this and then you come home and you yell and you scream and you cheat and you drink and you like, that doesn't make sense. So as a young adult, I was turned off the church. I thought it was, I thought church people were hypocrites. I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So flash forward to the age of 45. Still not religious. I might go to like Christmas service with my mom mm-hmm. or like Easter, right? When like two times a year you go to church, I would go and show up and just be nice and that'd be it. Yeah. And my son went off to prep school um, his junior and senior year in high school because he wanted to be a collegiate scholarship athlete. Yeah. So he ends up going to a Catholic school, mm-hmm. which we didn't even think anything of. It was more about like the academics and all that stuff. It was like, hey, it's a bonus, no yeah. big deal. I wasn't anti-religion. I just wasn't religious. So he goes away and comes back and there's a noticeable change and he's very um, serious about his faith. He prays before every meal. He prays every night. It's God bless you. God bless this. I'll leave it to God. I just noticed like a difference in him. And outside of that, everything about his life started to improve. His academics got better. He gets a scholarship. Um, He starts performing better in basketball. He just has this sort of maturity and peace about him. And um, I was just kind of watching from a distance. And then uh, one weekend he was home from school because his prep school was like four hours away. And uh, every time he would come over, like all of his high school buddies would come over. And we always had the house where kids would hang out. And they'd be down there playing video games till five in the morning, right? And they'd come up like the next day at like two in the afternoon, like with (laughs) pizza sauce all over their face and boogers in their eyes. And um, one Saturday he comes up and it's like 8.15. And he like comes up out of the basement and he's got like khakis and a shirt on. I'm like, where are you going? He goes, well, I'm going to church. I was like, oh, okay. And he goes to church. Next weekend comes up and it happens again. We like run into each other because I'm downstairs reading and doing stuff, letting the dog out. Yeah. And um, I, I go, where are you going? And he goes, I'm going to church. And I go, you're going to church again? And he looks at me and goes, I go to church every Sunday, dad. And I was like, um, dang, mm-hmm. stay right there. I went and changed, threw some water on my face, put some church clothes on and went to church. And it it was a, a very, um, like standing there with my son, watching him worship. Um, I really just started going to impress my son, which is kind of a weird turn of events. And each time I went, um, I felt like there was this burden taken off my shoulders when I left church. And I just started taking the advice that they would give me. Oddly enough, I had been friends with the pastor for multiple years. But he didn't judge me that I wasn't in church. He never said like, hey, where were you Sunday? Or I've never seen you at the church. But we became friends because I, I helped him with a real estate deal. And then um, I just started going to church. I started feeling better. Um, it really helped me with dealing with the stress of being a business owner and a father and a husband. And um, now it's probably my top priority. Like I always say, a good friend of mine said, um, hit, your, hit your knees before you hit your feet every day. And uh, pray and thank God for all of the things that you take for granted. So, yeah, it's become a really big part of my life this last year. I'm so thankful for it. And um, it's really strengthened my relationships with my employees. My pastor comes here once a month at our town hall and leads uh, like a leadership yeah. sort of talk and then weaves in some some lessons from the Bible that people can take away. Uh, we've hired him on like a retainer where if anybody's 
in need of some counseling. Um, everybody here can call our pastor and confide in him and work through stuff. And um, yeah, we've kind of woven it into, um, you know, one of the benefits of working here is you get spiritual supports. Wow, that's amazing. Well, we truly appreciate you coming on. Any like last words you would give the viewers? Any like advice or anything that's like on the top of your head right now you want to say? Um, yeah, I mean it's difficult to to try and boil down, um, you know, one piece of advice. But I, I think um, there's there's someone in my mastermind that uh, ran a massive business. He was wholesaling about a thousand deals a year, mm-hmm. and uh, he passed away a few months ago. Well, not even a few, it was like a few weeks ago. And uh, he took his own life. And um, I think a lot of times um, people don't talk enough about the dark side of being a business owner and an entrepreneur. And, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, a lot of it's glorified on podcast, and Facebook and stuff like that. So two pieces, two pieces of advice is, is make sure you get the total picture of what it's like to start a real estate business or being an entrepreneur. And... Everything that you see on social media is not 100% accurate. Talk to someone that's actually doing it and say, hey, what are the things that you don't talk about on social media? What would you like to change? Yeah. So you know what we're signing up for. And then once you have that, my second piece of advice would be to just keep going. Like, don't quit. Don't give up. Um, I read a really good piece of advice in, in a book I recently read and said, um, profound discovery is only 4% on the other side of resistance. So right when you feel like you're just can't handle it anymore and you're getting all this resistance and everything's happening against you and it's not going your way four percent on the other side you've already made a 96 percent right just keep going so um yeah that would be the words that i would well that's yeah that's awesome we'll make sure to leave all of eric's information down below and if you want to join his co- uh, coaching program to learn about novations we'll have that down there as well so with that being said we truly appreciate you coming on the podcast and we'll catch you on the next one Peace. Peace.